We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a 12 Papillon. And what's his name? Jameson. Jameson. And where did you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. It's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me, it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G-E-M-M-A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, like, so what, like... Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your uh, grandma's name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's always fun like no matter how many times i see it you still just look at it and go oh. so hopefully that's sort of relaxing everyone that and the fact that many of you've got beer which is making me really jealous right now so i'm going to try and do this and then join you so i'm going to talk about uh something something cyber and the look something something was just that i've got a lot of ideas and a lot of things that i think are really interesting and i thought i'll just I'll just put them all in a talk and I'll, I'll show you and it'll be a bit of fun and we'll see a bunch of different stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because there is just so much going on at the moment and I see so many interesting cyber things and I'm, I'm honestly never quite sure when they're even real or not. It's getting that weird. And I'm going to show you some of these today and I, I, think, you'll, uh, I think you'll enjoy it and I hope you'll learn a few things as well. Now, one of the things that I often like to start off with when I'm doing these, these talks is to just try and get a little bit of perspective uh, around hackers, because we're going to talk a lot about hackers, right? And people hear about hackers and they have these kind of images in their mind, like what are, what are hackers, what do hackers do? So I thought I better go out, get a bit of material and try and illustrate exactly what a hacker is. So I, I found some good info and <laughs> you'll... Uh, You'll notice some themes here. What do we know about hackers? Hoodies, very good. What else? Matrix. Uh, a lot of green. I don't know if you knew this, but hackers are very, very into their green. Apparently, they like binary too, which I guess is a good thing if they want to do anything with computers. That's kind of useful. And the interesting thing is, is that we see this imagery over and over again as a representation of hackers. And a lot of it is because it kind of makes them scarier, right? And think about how it appears in like the press. If we can make hackers scary, we're going to make the story scary. And we know this is what the media does, right? Like they go, how scary can we make this thing because people will read it? So we see imagery like this with hackers. Now, we can learn many things from here. So for example, this is how viruses spread. It's just like a bucket and they tip them out. They go up the rack. And you know how there's the holes in the top? That's where they get in. <laughs> the lesson out of this is make sure you cover the top of your server racks with something. <laughs> you probably won't get any viruses after that. I'll tell you. you may also have no computers, but that's another issue. So we have this interesting representation of, uh, of scariness. And we see scariness over and over again. And we see the themes that we've just discussed over and over again. And I recently saw a product pop up. It's called Cujo. Has anyone got a Cujo? No? Good. <laughs> so Cujo is a little device you get, and you put it in your home, no more hackers. It's like magic, right? And this is the way they sold it. 
But the thing is, you've got to convince people that they need to worry about hackers. So how are we going to do that? Well, we make scary videos like this. You may not know it, but you've probably already been hacked. Thousands of hacking attacks occur each day. Now, how do we know he's hacking? Green. Hoodie, green, very good. The music sounds scary, like something bad is happening. We know that much. But I was watching this video a little while ago, and this is sort of part of a bigger video. But I'm looking at the screen, and, and particularly earlier on, there's a little part of the screen that looks like this. And you look at it and you go, looks a lot like a browser address bar, doesn't it? You know, it's like the guy is in the browser. And, and, and that, to, to me, sort of seemed weird because this is not what I normally know of hackers. And I thought, okay, well, I've got to go and figure out how is he doing this. And I worked it out. I'm going to show you because this is enormously useful for you to impress your friends and family. Now, here's what you do. You go to a website called hackertyper.net. <laughs> Remember this. And then while you're there, you just mash the keyboard. <laughs> now, how do we know it's hacking? Green. Very good. All right. But there's, there's another trick to this as well. Because what you do is you, it's like you're mashing the keyboard and you go, I don't know, I'm going to break into the Pentagon or something like that. Mash, mash, mash. And you go, let me just see if I can get in. Ah, damn it. No, I can't get in. <laughs> and then you, you kind of hack just a little bit more and you go, I'll try it again. Ah, oh, man, no. All right, no, hang on. I know how to do it. Hack, 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 hack. Yes, we're in. <laughs> Amazing. Now, the... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the amazing thing about this is that this is exactly the code that appeared in that video. Like I zoomed and enhanced and went all CSI on it. And you can see exactly the same code blocks in the video as just here. Uh, and it's a true thing. So this is the way they uh, try and tell you that you've got security issues. Now, I thought we'd, uh, we'd move on to a topic on everyone's minds lately, and I'll, I'll just get straight into it. Uh, now, firstly, is it just me, or does he look remarkably like a stoned beaver? <laughs> I don't know. The nice thing is I can go most places in the world and do this, and everyone thinks it's awesome. Uh, now, as much as we'd like to sit here and sort of take the piss out of Trump all night, there is relevancy to this. Did you see that recently he did something stupid? <laughs> no, no, there's, there's a reason. This was a news headline, uh, and it's a serious news headline. So what they're saying is that uh, his website could have been open to these sorts of attacks. And here's the interesting thing. We, we are going somewhere with this. Bear with me. He had code on his website like this. Now, what do you reckon could happen with JavaScript like that? How much do you trust Igor Escobar? Because you're loading things off his GitHub repository. And that the premise that the press put forward is that if Igor, Igor, was to put some malicious code on there, it's JavaScript. And you can do just about anything if you can run JavaScript in someone else's browser. And, and this was interesting. I thought, okay, well, we, we should sort of, we should demonstrate what you could do, and then we'll demonstrate a defense that a lot of people don't know about. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over to a website which embeds code from an external resource, embeds it from Cloudflare. And then we're going to start modifying a few things. So first of all, let's go to the website. And I, I picked a really good one. I picked this one. Now, this is uh, trumpdonald.org. And it has this beautiful little thing where you, you move the trumpet around. You watch his eyes, right? And then w when you get to just the right spot, and you can just keep going like around and around and around as much as you want. Now, look, again, we could sit here all night and do this, and it would be fun. <laughs> but, but I'm going somewhere with this. Let's jump into the source code. And if we do a search for Cloudflare, you see how it's embedding resources off Cloudflare. All right, so they're using Cloudflare's CDN. So Cloudflare has a public CDN where they have a whole bunch of JavaScript libraries, CSS, fonts, all sorts of things. And you can use Cloudflare's CDN to embed content in your site. Now, people do this because... When they do that, Cloudflare's got 115 edge nodes around the world. So no matter where your customers are, they get something from very, very close to them. 
which is good news. So they're going to get something uh, without much latency. The other good thing about it is that when you load all this stuff off Cloudflare, you don't pay for it. It's just off their public CDN. So if you're paying outbound bandwidth, like you do with something like Azure, you save that cost. And the other cool thing is that if someone has already been to a website that embeds that same library, it's going to be cached. It's going to be fast. So there are lots of good reasons to load content off public CDNs. But people then say, OK, well, we, we've got the problem like Trump had with his website, which is, what if someone maliciously modifies that code? So what if someone changes it and does something to any site that embeds it? Because again, once you put JavaScript on a website, you can kind of do just about anything with it. So I'm going to do a demo here, and I'm going to open up uh, Fiddler. And Fiddler has this really neat little feature called Fiddler Script. I don't know how many of you have used this. A lot of people use Fiddler but not seen Fiddler Script. And what's going to happen now is we've got Fiddler open, so our traffic gets proxied through Fiddler. And Fiddler acts a little bit like a man in the middle. And it can make changes to files as they're loaded. So I'm going to go and jump into an event. They've got different events here, on before request, on before response. I'm going to jump into on before response. And down here, I've got a very special Trumpification script. Now, here's what's going to happen. When I run this, so when I reload the script file and it comes through Fiddler, it's going to modify it as it comes through. And, and what we're really trying to emulate here is what would happen if that JavaScript file from Cloudflare was modified before it got to the browser. Now, in the case of the Trump situation and the GitHub site, we'd sort of be more worried about it being modified in, in storage. But this is just going to let us sort of emulate what would happen. So here's what we'll do. Let's just go and open up this one here. We'll open that up there. So this is the script as it stands. This is what was loaded into the browser. And I just jumped down to the bottom, and there's you know, nothing too special there. If I give that a hard refresh, so that will now pull it through Fiddler, and it should get modified. If I jump down to the bottom, OK, now we've got Trumpification script. So let's now reload the site. And again, what we're sort of trying to emulate here is what would happen if this script was changed somewhere else. So hard refresh is going to pull it through Fiddler. It's going to add the Trumpification script. We're going to see how this website changes in a potentially malicious way. So Trump is thinking, apparently he apparently doesn't do a lot of that, but here we are. All right, so we've now got like little driving Trump all over the place because what the script has done is it's actually modified the DOM and in, well, the script itself has modified the DOM and it's injected a background image into every div. So what we've demonstrated is that we've changed the file outside of the site. The site is now getting something different to what it expected. It's still running. You can do this. Still works. Still works. Okay, so that's the problem that we're trying to solve. Let's go and have a look at another site. Who's used this one before? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a lot. Who's been in uh, the Dropbox data breach? LinkedIn data breach. Ashley Madison data breach. <laughs> Come on. Oh, yes. That is the correct answer, by the way. Ashley, what? No, no, no. All right. Just do the same thing. I'm going to view the source, jump down to the end. I am also embedding a library from Cloudflare down here. So I'm exposing myself to the same problem. So let's do the same thing. I'll pop that open another tab, jump down the end. There's no Trumpification script in there because this is the cached version from before. But if I give it a hard reload and we ignore those Fiddler errors like so, that'll pull it from Cloudflare through Fiddler and then I go down the end and now we've got Trumpification. So in theory, we should see my precious website with Trump all over it, in theory. Let's have a look. So we'll go back to here. We'll give it another hard reload. Now, as it's reloading, I'm going to hit F12 into the dev tools. I'm going to leave the console open. And we get an error. Now, this is an error that wasn't there before. And I'm going to zoom this in a little bit so you can see what's going on. It says, failed to find a valid digest in the integrity attribute for the resource. And then it goes on and it gives us this sort of CDM path with computed SHA-256 integrity. And we've got this great big hash here. 
And what we're actually seeing here is something called SRI, or sub-resource integrity. And the way it works is that if I go back and look at my source code here, you'll see that whilst this begins like a normal script tag, it then says, let's add an attribute called integrity. And we've actually got a SHA-384 hash here, which goes all the way through to there. Now, here's the, the beauty of how this works. You get yourself a JavaScript file, or you can do it with CSS as well, but in this case, it's JavaScript. You get yourself a JavaScript file that you trust. Okay, so in this case, it was jQuery. So I trust jQuery 2.2.4. I trust this file. I create a hash of that file, and I add it to the integrity attribute. I can now go and grab that file from wherever I like, public CDNs, GitHub, something that someone else controls. And when the file downloads and it sees that there's an integrity attribute on the script tag, it hashes the file and it checks it. And if they don't match, we get this error. Now, the really neat thing here as well is that my site still works, even though it has blocked the file. And it still works because I've got a fallback position just here. And it looks to see if it can find window.jQuery. It won't be able to because the browser has rejected the file and not run it. And if it can't find it, it says, OK, well, look, let's do this. Let's actually write out a reference to my own local jQuery file. It's like magic, right? And if you want to make one of these, you can grab a copy of whatever library it is you're wanting to embed. And then you can go over to SRI hash generator, paste it in, and say hash it. And it'll go away, retrieve the file. You've got to make sure that that one is good. And there are other ways of generating the hash as well. And then it will go, OK, here's your tag. So this is awesome because this allows you to have your cake and eat it too, right? So what's not to love? Browser support. All right, let's do browser support. There is one issue here. One uh, particular manufacturer's browser. <laughs> you know I'm going, don't you? So uh, no support in IE, no support in Edge, which is which is kind of a bit of a shame because we'd really like to be able to use this more. And what it means is that if I go and grab, say, Internet Explorer, like so, and I go to Have I Been Pwned, now that's from Cache, right? But if I give this a hard reload, the same thing's going to happen, right? It's going to pull that file through Fiddler. Fiddler's going to add the Trumpification script. And my beautiful website is going to have somewhat of a problem. So you've got to sort of make a decision. There he goes. He's all over the place. So this didn't happen in Chrome. This actually also won't happen in Firefox. There's just, again, one sort of skew of browsers. So you've got to make a decision. Like, do you go and embed things from external resources and get all the benefits of CDNs, but then take the risk with non-supporting browsers? Or do you just load everything locally, and then you don't get the upsides? So swings and roundabouts here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just close that one down because I really don't want to keep seeing uh, everything Trumpified. I don't think that's going to make for a good demo. All right, so that's SRI. Let's go on to something different. And I thought I'd talk about scams for a while because we see a lot of scams that run on the internet. And recently I saw this one, Twitter verification. And this site was offering to help you get verified. So you go along here and you... You click on the Get Started button. You go and enter all your credit card details. I'm sure that'll work out just fine. Uh, except it probably won't work out just fine. This was linked to from a promoted tweet, which is kind of ironic as well. This is at payment.html. You strip payment.html out, and you have a problem. You have no default document. You have a directory listing. You look around a little bit, and you go, oh, here's an interesting file. And this is what we often see, right? So we often see these scam phishing websites stood up with the local index of everyone who signed up. And it's just sitting there like just dumped out to a text file. And look at all the data here. It's including things like CVVs from credit cards, all your personal info. I went and registered on one of these just for fun, just to see what would happen. And it did that. Uh, so <laughs> they may also not be outputting coding, which is, which is also a bit of a problem. We see a lot of scams around, right? Like we see a lot of scams happening on the web. And I saw one a little while ago, uh, which was this. 
And I don't know if this happens in Norway or the other places that you're all from, but one of the things that happens in Australia a lot is you'll be at home and it's like 6 o'clock at night, you're cooking the dinner and trying to organise the kids. And someone calls up and there's that sort of long wait when you pick up the phone, like a, a VoIP call from a long way away. And then an Indian voice comes on the line and says, we're from Microsoft, you've got viruses. Does that happen here? All right, well, this is the lady doing it, believe it or not. This is Comantra, and Comantra is the site which has perpetuated a lot of these scams. Now, this kept happening to me as well, and it was driving me nuts because I was like, look, I know it's, it's a scam, you know, go away, I'm not going to talk to you. I don't think the CRM's very good because they kept calling me. And eventually I went, all right, if you want to keep calling me, I would like to see where you're going to go with this. So I created a very special VM which is this one just here. Now, I thought, okay, what I'll do is I'll create my special VM and I'll put some interesting things on the desktop. So you'll see I've got stuff like, uh, I I pretended I was Max. So I've got Max's porn stash up there. I've got passwords, finances. I thought the whole Bond and Rick Astley thing might give it away. Uh, Turns out scam is not so smart. So... (laughs) Here's how the scam works, right? They call you up and they go, you know, we're from Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Imagine, let's say, non-technical people. So think about elderly relatives are often the sort of people that get hit. So the scam is talking to them and they go, okay, you've got viruses. And they're like, oh, no, can you help fix it? And they're like, yeah, sure, we can help you. What you do is you go to your PC, press Windows R, type in E-V-E-N-T-V-W-R which many of you will know will take us to the event viewer. And when you're in the event viewer, then they say, okay, open up the Windows logs, go down to application. And when you're there, just start scrolling through. And if you see any errors, oh, holy shit, they're viruses. And of course, the, the, the person on the other end of the line is like, well, it's red. It doesn't look very good, does it? You know, maybe I do have viruses. And they then go through this social engineering process of getting you to give them remote control to your desktop they install crapware and all sorts of other things you don't need. All of this is for free. And then they tell you you go to pay them. And if you don't pay them, in some cases, they just nuke the entire machine. So these are the guys, right? They're over here. Now, as it turns out, they were working this morning when I prepared this demo. Now they're returning 500, which isn't so good. But it doesn't matter because what I wanted to show you is still there. If I go to forward slash robots.txt, it's just like all their database backups are sitting there. But don't worry, it's in a robots file. You're not actually allowed to go there. So scammers, they, they do like to scam. And it's, it's just interesting when we look at the ways that data is exposed. And, you know, inevitably it's stuff like this. Now there's all their customers sitting there. Often we see websites breached and we see all sorts of reasons about, look, there must have been like really malicious people going in there, breaking into it. And I kind of like Hanlon's Razor. And Hanlon's Razor basically says, look, when you see something like this, it's not necessarily that someone was malicious. It may just be that someone else was stupid. And here's what we're going to look at now, because we're going to look at sort of places where data is exposed so readily, uh, ultimately through mistakes. So there's a really good example here. This is an Indian pathology lab. And an Indian pathology lab that got breached, breached back in, uh, back in last year, around about December time frame. And there was a bit of a problem where 43,000 pathology reports were obtained by other people. Now, pathology reports is things like, what's the results of your blood tests? What's the results of, uh, say, in utero tests when a woman's pregnant? What's the result of your HIV test? 43,000 records publicly exposed. And they put out a statement. This actually came via the press. Their website was hacked. They were filing a complaint with the cyber cell of Mumbai police, which sounds really scary. Now, you want to know how they were hacked? I'll show you. Somebody went here. All right, so it's just a full-on directory listing. 
And here's the amazing thing. We, we sort of see this stuff all the time where there's huge amounts of data that get inadvertently exposed publicly on websites. And the, the sort of disturbing thing with this particular case is I was trying to get in touch with them. I couldn't get in touch with them. Someone had sent me this link. It certainly wasn't me going around looking for pathology reports. Incidentally, the reason we knew that there were things like HIV tests is because all of this got indexed by Google, 43,000 documents. So you could do a Google and search for the scope that was limited to this site and then just add like HIV to the end. And you got to see Google caches of the entire documents without ever actually accessing and loading them from the site. So I'm in touch with them and I'm going, look, you know, I think you probably should lock these up. Couldn't get through. A journalist eventually gets through. And these guys tell the journalist, this is in December, it was about the 1st of December, they said, uh, we're actually fixing this. We're launching a new website next month and it will be good then. And this is what they said, like, we're just going to leave all this out there for a month and then fix it. And then they got a lot of social pressure and that sort of, it expedited things, shall we say. Now, you might look at this and go, okay, well, this is like just a little Indian pathology website. Why don't we go and look at something a little bit bigger? And this was around the same time frame. This was later last year. And this was actually related to Michael Page. Now, Michael Page is a really large global recruitment company. They're all over the world. And someone got in touch with me and they said, uh, I've got Michael Page data. And people, just for context, it's not like they get in touch with me because of my Australian heritage and they know I've got the criminal thing going. They, <laughs> they, get, they get in touch with me because they think, well, maybe this will be useful data for Have I Been Pwned, right? I can put it in there, I can make it searchable. So a guy gets in touch with me and says, I've got this data. And then he says, Michael Page is Cap Gemini. It's like, well, no, it's not. What do you mean? And he said, well, what's actually happened here is Cap Gemini, and in case you don't know who Cap Gemini are, they're one of the world's largest outsourcing providers. They've got revenue of about 11 billion euros a year. They hire 180,000 people worldwide. I mean, they are massive. And anyway, it turned out that there was a bit of an issue on Cap Gemini's side. And what I thought I'd do first is show you the way this was represented, the way it was written up, and then we'll look at what the issue was. So the write-up said there was an unauthorized third party who illegally gained access. And that second line sort of sounds like someone did something pretty nasty, right? Here's what they did. They opened a website. Now, what was actually happening, the guy that found this, what he was doing is he was just scanning the IPv4 address range looking for directory listings. So just going through, knocking on port 80, just going, hey, uh, let's just make a GET request. Do you return a page that has index of in the title? And do you have a .sql.gzip? Yes, okay, great, found something. And he gets hits over and over and over and over again because organizations do this. And what I think is really interesting with the Cap Gemini example as opposed to, say, the India example is that a lot of times people say, well, you know, the Indian one, it's a small company, they don't have many people, maybe not a lot of expertise. But this is very much the opposite of this, right? This is the total end of the scale. And what we know from this is that it doesn't really matter how large the organisation is. And we don't just know that from this, we know it from a lot of other empirical evidence. No matter how big they are, they tend to get exposed to the same risks. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Does anyone know what a Google dork is? Now, th this is not my Australian accent saying Google doc. This is dork as in like the derogatory term. But I'll show you what I mean. We can go over to a browser and we'll just grab this one here. And we can give it a bit of something like uh, we were just seeing on the screen index of. So I'll search for index of. I've got a saved one here. Uh, let's actually go back because that is not exactly what I wanted. Try that again. Index of .sql.gzip. So I'll zoom in and show you what we've done here. That's easy, yeah? yeah? And then we've got all of these results of websites with database backups just sitting there. Like that takes seconds, and here are thousands and thousands of websites. And you could click through to any of these and see the data. Now, that would be hacking, so we won't do that, but it's not hacking if you just look at Google Cache. <laughs> I, so, so far, I haven't been proven wrong. So far. 
We're recording this, aren't we? Oh, shit. All right. It'll be fine. I'll be back in Australia. <laughs> so long as this goes live after I get back. All right, but you see the point, and I guess this kind of crazy thing about it is there's stuff like this just all over the web. And even if it's not like database backups, what if we went back one and we just gave it a bit of, uh, a bit of .git? Do you think anyone would publish their Git repositories publicly? Of course they would. Why not? Now, fortunately, nobody ever puts anything sensitive in a Git repository, so this really doesn't matter. <laughs> But you can imagine how it happens, right? Like someone's just picked up the entire directory of the website and gone, hey, let's just grab this and we'll just dump it on the production site, you know, pick it all up and publish it. We've probably all done this at one stage in the past. So there's a huge amount of data that's just sitting out there massively publicly facing. Now, moving on, one of the other things that tends to happen a lot is we get very sensitive about personal attributes of data being exposed. So particularly in Europe, you're very, very privacy conscious. So we've got things like our names, addresses, our phone numbers. We, or you guys, citizens and residents of, of Europe, own that data. It's personal data. And I want to talk a little bit about how that gets exposed. Now, I'll, uh, I'll skip past yet another Trumpism. Uh, if you like seeing more things about Trump, come to PubCon <laughs> tomorrow night. That'll be a different thing. And we'll, uh, we'll just sort of get a little, bit of, a little bit of insight about the sorts of personal data attributes that people like to have access to. Hey, I got two of these phone books. Didn't know if you wanted one. Hey, how long have we known each other? Long time. And yet we've never discussed mother's maiden names, the names of old pets, high school mascots, favorite teachers. Heck, I don't even know the last four digits of your social. All useful info, right? Like it's all useful info that... People such as social engineers, fishers, identity thieves want to have. So it's info that we need to protect very, very carefully. Which brings me to these guys. There may be some people in the audience who've seen me write about this before. For everyone else, get ready for this. StrawberryNet is a Hong Kong-based cosmetics website. And what they do is they sell a whole bunch of things online. Cosmetics, as it were. And you can go to StrawberryNet and you can buy many of these things. So I might be looking through here and saying, well, oil-free moisturizer. I'm not sure why I need oil-free moisturizer, but it looks good. Let's take one of those. Now, we're going to add it to the bag and go and check out. And we're going to express check out. And this is where it starts to get interesting. What you do, because this is a cosmetic site, and it's probably going to be used by more women than men, you pick a female name. Now you pick a common one. Let's say Sarah. Sarah's pretty common. And then you go, okay, let's pick a common domain name, a common email provider, like Gmail. And let's now go and try this express checkout, and we'll see how this goes. See if there's anything interesting in the way this is done. Now, in case you are looking at this and going, well, Troy, this is very irresponsible, you should be reporting this privately, sit tight because you're going to see how, how hard I have tried and how they actually view this. Now, you might also be looking at this and going, well, like it's bad because there's personal info on there, but they've obfuscated it, which is good. But then they do this, change billing address. Now, I'm going to zoom in a little bit because I want you to be able to experience this in its full glory. Watch very, very carefully. Ah! Now, luckily, all of that disappeared before any of you could see it properly. So it's okay. Except it's not really okay. Because you can go over and you can use your inspector and inspect that field and find out that it does actually have a name in it. And you might then be looking at this and saying, well, for a girl named Sarah, Dick is a really unusual first name. And you might then be looking at the other field next to it, the last name field, and go, it's also quite odd that her last name is But. <laughs> because the problem is, is that this has changed billing address, and you can go in and change it to anything else you like without any authorization. It's just, I know an email address. And it's, 
this, when I saw this, it was just unfathomable. So I was running a workshop for a government department, actually, in Australia. And we do this enumeration module where we say, look, what are the ways where data might be exposed from a website? Uh, so, for example, you put an email address into the password reset feature and it comes back and says, it is there and we've sent you an email or it's not there. That's leakage, right? Because it tells you the email addresses on the site. So when I was told about this, I was like, you got to tell them, you got to let them know. And the guy's like, no, I really, I tried. And they came back to me and they said, don't worry, because we've got SSL on the site. <laughs> so, so basically, as some sort of freaky stalker pervert is siphoning women's data out of the site, anyone else trying to hack them on the wire can't see the data. <laughs> So I wrote about this, and a bunch of people got very angry, and they wrote to StrawberryNet and said, look, this is ridiculous. And StrawberryNet very kindly replied, and they had some reasons. They said, well, look, we are actually PCI compliant. All of this is on my blog, too. I, I am not making this up. Go and have a look at it. And uh, someone else wrote to them. They came back and said, yeah, well, customers like our system with no password. Now, I don't know who exactly they surveyed, Maybe like the internal marketing team? I don't know. And my favorite one where they said, using your email address as your password is sufficient security. <laughs> this is why I know I have a long and prosperous career in this industry. It's stuff like this. All right, let's go on and do something a little bit different. And I thought we'd talk a little bit about SQL injection because SQL injection is still a massive topic on the internet. And you're going to see what I mean by this shortly. So we'll start with a little video. Now, I admit I have corrupted a lot of databases with SQL. <laughs> Usually my own. <laughs> but how do we know they're hacking? Green screen, very good. All right, this is out of the Jason Bourne movie, and I just thought it was funny the way they represent it. But inevitably, they're talking about SQL injection. And I want to sort of start to go through a few other mechanics of how SQL injection works. And I'm going to do a few demos and show you a few things. And the way I like to demo this is there's a blog post here. And it's a blog post that someone wrote a couple of years ago. And I normally wouldn't be up here in front of a crowd basically pulling it apart, which is what we're going to do. But as you'll see a little bit later, this guy wrote the blog post. It's got some, uh, let's just say, creative things in it. And I left a very, very nice, polite comment saying, you really probably don't want to do this, and what about this and the other injection things? And he ignored it. And then all these people came in afterwards and said, thank you, this is very useful. I've just done this on my site. And I go, ah. Oh. Well, actually, I sort of go, oh, shit, not more of it. And then I go, I'm going to have such a good career in this industry. <laughs> but look, let's just start having a look at it. And I'm going to scroll down a little bit and we'll, uh, we'll stop somewhere and just, just sort of ask the audience what we do and don't like. So let's start with the connection string. How do we feel about this connection string? Now, it's dark, but somehow I can still see a lot of shaking heads. What don't we like about it? Okay, so uh, look, if you said password, that is an eight-character password. They're all sequential numbers, probably not so good. Some people may have said, well, this is not the way that we should be creating a connection string into a database in ASP.NET. Other people may have said, well, you probably also shouldn't really be using SA. Like, SA is, is not a particularly great way of connecting into the database because it's a very highly privileged account. It's, it's basically God rights. You can do anything. Do you think that happens, though? Does it happen much? You want to know how to find out? <laughs> All right, I'll show you. Of course you do. Okay, so let's, uh, in fact, we'll go back to there, we'll grab a new tab, and we'll do another Google Doc. And we can do a Google Doc for in URL web config. Now, let's have a look at what's happening here. FTP, because Google indexes things over FTP, if you leave it anonymously accessible. Web.config, anyone doing ASP.NET knows what that is. Anyone who's not doing it, this is where your connection strings are and your API keys and the things that you want to keep secret. And web servers such as IIS are designed to never return this. But you can on FTP because that's how some people get the files there. And we've got hundreds of results 
of web.configs being returned. And as we established, you could go and click through to any of these. But like we said earlier, that would be hacking, but there are cached versions. And it looks empty because it's XML and it doesn't render to the screen, but when you view the source code, you can see it. So we've got those there, but getting back to the point of SA, let's just filter this down a little bit. I'm going to take that out and we'll just put, a, we'll just put an SA in here because we would expect to see that in a connection string in the exposed web.config. And what do you know? We find them. SA. Uh, not such a good password, that one. <laughs> also not so good. Uh, probably even worse. <laughs> And we, we kind of see this over and over and over again. And th there's sort of an, an interesting, I guess, issue with this when we go back to here, which is that often when I see code on a blog post that is it may be sort of ancillary to the purpose of the post itself. So, for example, this post is about how to do a password reset. And I'll hear people say, no, nah, look, don't worry about this because this, this is not what I'm writing about. It's just like a, an illustration. You know, look at the bit doing the reset. And I'll sort of say to people, yeah, but you know that people will come along and they'll copy and paste this. And they will use exactly what is in this code, published somewhere on the web, on their own site without understanding it. Let me show you how I know this. I wrote about something a while ago, about the Nissan Leaf. Now, this was earlier last year. And for those of you who don't know what a Nissan Leaf is, you're probably not from Norway because they're everywhere here. They're these little cars. And someone in my workshop when I was here in Oslo in January last year, we do this exercise where you get your phone and you proxy your phone through your PC and you look at the traffic that your phone sends to the PC. And the guy in my workshop had a Nissan Leaf. And he's like, I wonder how my phone knows which Leaf to speak to. Like, how does it know to, say, turn the heating on in my Leaf instead of the heating in someone else's? Now, being from Australia, I didn't even know this was a thing, right? <laughs> We have a whole set of different problems. It's like you get in your car when it's hot and the sun's out and the seatbelt buckle is there and you get branded. Seriously, that's a real thing. So we're not used to turning the heater on our car, but apparently here you are. And uh, he wanted to figure it out. And eventually he found what the API key was in his phone that identified his car, the secret that would allow him to control the temperature in his car, pull back the battery status, find the trip history. And what he learned is that secret is the VIN number. And in case you don't know what a VIN number, it is an API key printed in every car's windscreen. <laughs> and I was here in Norway just walking around past cars going, there's an API key, there's an API key. I was just taking photos. The thing is, though, you didn't even need to know someone else's API key because they're innumerable, and it's basically just the last five or six digits where you can just randomize them, and every now and then you get a hit, you get another car. So we reported this to Nissan and said, uh, you probably should fix your cars. And that, to be honest, it, it wasn't an easy exercise. A month later, they still hadn't fixed it. It was still exposed. And this was private disclosure, responsible disclosure. And after a month, I said, okay, look, I have seen enough evidence that there is risk from this, a privacy risk with people pulling back data. Other risks in terms of, I think most Nissan Leaf owners would not actually want someone else controlling a physical part of their car, which is what the climate control is. So I published a blog post, and that's the blog post you see here. And then they pulled the service straight away. It just disappeared. And it went offline for quite some time, and eventually it came back online, and they had a new app. And this is the app. Now, does, does anyone see anything in this app at all unusual? In case you're not seeing it, read from the bottom up. This is the real app. This is what they put out there in the app store. And I, I want to explain how this happened. And, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to flick over here. I'm going to go to, uh, I'm gonna go to here. Uh, you know this site, don't you? Um, I'm going to go to here. I'm going to go down to there. So, so someone copied and pasted code out of Stack Overflow and put it in an app that controls cars without reading it and pushed it out to the world. But it's even worse. 
Because what do the first two words here say? The Spirit, yeah? What do the first two words here say? Someone actually read that and typed it out. Which makes it even worse because they had all of these keystrokes where their mind could have gone, maybe this isn't such a good idea. (laughs) But they did it anyway because it seemed like a good idea at the time, I assume. Okay, so look, let's get back to this bloke for a second. Uh, If we go back to our SQL injection site. How do we feel about this SQL here? Is this good SQL in terms of SQL injection or bad SQL? Show of hands, who thinks it's bad? Who thinks it's good? Oh, you know what? For those of you down the front, there are a lot more people thinking it was bad than good. This is actually good. And the reason it's good is that when we look at where we've got email just here, this is parameterization. And we've got email decorated with the little at symbol. And then we go to the select command, go to the parameters collection, and we add email, which matches up to that guy. And then we get the the text value from this txt email field. Now, what parameterization means is that no matter what value gets put in that field, it will not change the structure of the query. It will always try and find an email address that has that exact value. So this is good. Parameterization is what we want to do to protect against SQL injection risks. How do we feel about the next one? Who thinks it's good? Who thinks it's bad? The bads have it. Okay, so the problem we've got here, and the the reason I show this is it's just beautiful to put them both right next to each other, the good and the bad. In the bad, what we're doing is we're taking that TXT email field and we're just concatenating it into a great big string. And then no matter what you put in that field, it will form part of the query. And when it goes down and executes non-query, the database doesn't know what is query and what is data. It just has this one big statement. So if, for example, I was to create an email address called single quote, semicolon, drop table, login table, dash, dash, and send it to there, this would execute. It would drop the login table, and I know it would drop the login table because the guy is connecting with SA, and I can do whatever the hell I want. So this is a beautiful example, and, and to my earlier point, As we scroll down a little bit, uh, I left him a very nice comment, I thought. Friendly feedback. And what sort of struck me as alarming is, okay, this is kind of alarming. I'm not sure why, but anyway. As we went down, you you get people saying, uh, you know, really helpful, useful. Thank you. Very nice and easy to understand. And you realize that a lot of the bad stuff you see on the internet is just replicated from other places. I think at some point, probably around about this stage, this was September last year, I think I tweeted this because the the tone started to change. And I was sort of like, are you sure? Easy copy paste. Reset passwords at the bank. And it's right about here I go, I think the trolls are into this, right? And and as it goes on, they started going, no security flaws at all. We were hacked within the first week. (laughs) And and this one, Google when you get home. Don't do it here. Trust me. (laughs) Okay. So this is how we see SQL injection risks sort of propagating in this way. Now, the, the other sort of side to the risk is that we see really bad... I guess really bad advice about how to go and hack this stuff. And, and probably the best way to illustrate this is I'm going to show you a video that I found on YouTube where someone talks about how to go and break into sites exactly like the one we just saw. Now, bear with me. I'm going to show you a few little clips from this guy and, or this guy, and I'll, uh, I'll give a few comments on it as well. Let's do a professional video. Let's actually show you how the concept works. And um, I'm using... Um uh, the SQL or SQL method here, SQL injection. Now, did anyone else hear that and not think of this? <laughs> right? Except it's a hacking screw. Now, the guy sounds, you know, like maybe 15, 16. He's a kid. And, and this is sort of part of the observation here, which is that SQL injection is such a severe flaw 
but it's also such an easily exploitable one that we see children getting into it. So this guy goes on. Let's listen to a little bit more. But I, I will teach you how to do that. And, and there are easy methods to do this. So do not worry. Do not worry about this. Um, yeah, um, no, uh, I just uh, don't worry about the little jump cut there. <laughs> okay, so uh, it, it maybe not like plural site standards of training. <laughs> All right, so then he goes on and he goes to this website. And this is a website that's got a whole bunch of various hacks on it. And he's looking at what you now know as a Google Doc. And he's going to show you how he uses this Google Doc to break into a website. Um, sorry. Oh, I don't know. I forgot that Firefox can't do that. So the first site was this one, which is literally this. So if I just go on here, yeah, this opens up this. Okay, so... First of all, see how indiscriminate this was. Like, he's just gone, let's search Google. The first result we get is the one we're going to hack into. This is not targeted. It's not like these people have wronged me. You know, they're killing babies or genetically modifying food or whatever other bullshit reason hacktivists come up with. His criteria was you're at the top of Google. Okay, so with this extension, what we do is put a little apostrophe here, little comma-ish. Put it there. Press enter. And there we go. So this means that we have an error in the database. So there's an error in their database. So And their database is MySQL server. There you go. So uh, because it's my um, school or MySQL, we can target it and grab all the info. It's easy, isn't it? And the scary thing is he's right because if you jump over to a browser and you do another Google Doc for something like in your URL, uh, let's say PHP, because we know that's going to have issues. <laughs> this is a .NET-centric event, isn't it? Just making sure. And we, you sort of just grab random stuff, and you go, okay, this one's got an ID in it, this one's got an ID in it, uh, this one down here's got an ID in it, and we go over there and we say, let's just put one character in, because one character is not hacking, I don't think. <laughs> uh, okay, that's got a SQL exception there. Let's put one character in here. Uh, that's got a SQL exception there. Let's put one character in here. Uh, that's got a SQL exception there. Now, this, th honestly, this was me just doing this. This was not pre-recorded video. You can try this at home. Don't go any further than that. All right, so let's see what happens next. So next, you want to um, have this program, Havage. All right, so... This sort of takes us to the point end because what he's going to do now is he uses this freely available software to break in. And the, the amazing thing about this, again, is that he's a kid, right? He's a kid managing to break in and pull data out of the system. So I thought, we'll do another demo. We'll make this a really interesting interactive demo. And I'll get, like, the, the youngest person I can find to break into this. All right, what about you? You're, you're little. Come up here. You want to have a go? All right. Okay, so, what's your name? Ari. Ari. How old are you, Ari? Seven. Right, and we've never met before, have we? Yes, we have, Dad. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, why don't you get up here? You, you need a stool because you're only a little hacker. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to... Don't hack other sites, all right? We, we've got to hack just the right site. So, we're going to go to... Let's go to here. All right, so now Ari's going to do a demo. So Ari, let's, uh, let's have a look at what happens here. This is a site of mine that you're allowed to hack. Now he's going down here and he's selecting one of the cars here, one of the manufacturers. He's found McLaren's. And he's copying the URL. Now, if you know how to copy, you can be a hacker too. So he's copying this. He's going to put it on the clipboard. Now, once he has this, he's halfway there because he can then go down and open free hacking software. This is what we just saw, right? Havage. And he's pasting this into a field that says target. Now, once he's got that in there, he goes and analyzes. And this is just making HTTP requests. So hitting the website, website goes down to the database, and it's pulling data back out of the database. It's trying to figure out what the database name is. And it comes back up and it says, here's your database name, DB Hack... Oh, he's moving ahead of me. Okay, so... <laughs> Then he goes and he gets tables because he's getting all the tables out of the database. And he goes, okay, I got those. Those are good. He has to choose which table he wants. 
he goes to user profile. That looks pretty good, doesn't it? Why don't I get all the columns out of the user profile data? Out of the user profile table. Here's all the columns. So now he's just got to figure out what he actually wants from there. He's smart, so he's going to email address. And, of course, he's going to password as well. And then the only thing he's got to do is get data, and then here comes all the data out of the system. <laughs> Give Ari a round of applause. That's awesome. <laughs> now, we, we practiced this, and there was something you forgot before you started hacking. Uh, what? Ah, there we go. Now he's hacking. All right. Good boy. Okay, so on that note, let's finish there, but we've got a little bit of time in case you want to ask, are there any questions about SQL Injection? Or myself as well. Does anyone have any questions about what we just saw? Or is it just like stunned silence? <laughs> Would you go home and teach your children? No, don't do that. <laughs> Yes, over here. Sorry again? Why are all those sites still online? It's a bit of a mystery, actually. <laughs> um, they may still be online, but there may be lots of backups of their database in, uh, in other places. But it, it's, it's amazing. A lot of them get taken down, but a lot of them pop up again very soon as well. And I, I wonder how much people realise their data is actually being exfiltrated from the system. Because if it's like SQL injection and it's, it's non-damaging, they're literally just selecting data out, I reckon a lot of them don't even know. Very often when I get sent data breaches, the first the organisation knows is when I go, uh, is this your data? And they're like, oh, yeah, actually, it is our data. We didn't know. Had no idea. Any other questions? Yes. All right, so when I find a security breach, how long do I wait before doing what? Before publishing it. Okay, so the, the, the short answer is it depends. Now, something like Nissan is a good example, and, and this adheres to what I, I think most security professionals would say is sort of disclosure best practice. I got in touch with them privately. They responded quickly. We emailed back and forwards. We spoke that week, and then nothing happened. And I kept emailing them and saying, what's the status? Are you fixing this? People are at risk. And what eventually happened is... We got to the point where I knew that other people were exploiting this. And that's when I said, okay, guys, look, I'm going to publish this tomorrow. Are there any comments or anything that you would like to add to the blog post? So that was one month. And I had to make a call based on the exposure, the risk to people, and then the risk of if I did disclose, what would happen? Like, would people start to exploit it before they could shut it down? There are other cases where there are things that I would never publicly share, like the, the, um, the pathology lab data. Even if they hadn't fixed it a month later, I'm not going to write a blog post going, here are 43,000 reports that include HIV results. So it's definitely case by case, and it really depends on the company doing the right thing and re responding responsibly as well. Yes? Yes? Okay, so uh, he said, is the integrity check just a method for validating scripts such as the Trumpification script? Uh, so that is the only method we have that is native in the browser that allows you to check the integrity of an external file. Uh, and like I said, like that works on JavaScript. It also works on CSS as well. So long as you're using Chrome or Firefox. <laughs> that's, the, that's the caveats. Anyone else? Yeah. All right. So I, the, the question here is, that do I have any, any tips to help websites respond faster when you, you do report something? Because you've reported something and they're not fixing it in a, a speedy fashion, right? Uh, honestly, the, the tip is, is that I get to a point where I go, OK, well, look, this is going to be public. And it's going to be public either via my blog or the other one that I find is really useful is journalists are very, very good at getting traction. And that there's a few useful things about going to a journalist. So one is that when a company hears it's a journalist contacting them asking about a security breach and they're going to write something, 
they're like, okay, so this is actually going to be in the newspaper. It's going to be serious. The other is, is that it does divest a little bit of risk from me because I'm not the one having to have that direct discussion where they might get threatening or legal or things like that. And finally, journalists, and there are some really good security journalists out there. So people like Joseph Cox from Motherboard or Zach Whitaker from ZDNet, they're very used to framing security issues with companies. They're, they're security journalists. So getting in touch with someone like that if you found something really interesting also helps expedite things. I've got time for about one more. Any others? Yes. All right, good, good question. So many attack vectors, how can I as a developer know I'm not screwing up? Have a think about the things you saw today. Most of you are pretty sure when you're doing that, right? Like, uh, I left my databases publicly exposed, not so good. I would say that the single most thing, and I have a vested interest given what I do, uh, is training for developers. So I've been doing training here this week. We did a, a two-day workshop on Monday and Tuesday. I'll be back here in January doing another workshop as well, actually, for the same organisers of this event. And just spending a couple of days sort of going through the way these risks work and the way attacks occur makes a fundamental difference. And it's just two days, and you take that and you use that for dozens of projects over many, many years. So that's, that's my answer. I honestly think uh, definitely the best possible thing you can do is develop a training. We're out of time, so thank you very much for, for coming, everyone. I hope you enjoyed Ari and my talk.